All right, good afternoon and welcome to Turk's Winter Science Speak Seminar. My name is Heather Segali, Education and Outreach Director of the UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center. To learn more about Turk, the research we conduct here and around the world, the public education programs we provide for the local community, um, and our work with the agencies here in the Tahoe Basin, please visit our website, tahoe.ucdavis.edu. You can also find out how to follow us on social media, how you can participate in our activities and, the, and help support the work we do. One of our goals is to facilitate interaction, dialogue and discussion, something that is certainly much more difficult on Zoom. Um, so we will be attempting to address questions at the conclusion of today's presentation via the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, your microphones have been muted, so the only way uh, to effectively communicate with us is through the Q&A. Um, the chat is also live, um, but if you could put your questions in the Q&A. And before I introduce today's speakers, I wanted to say that upcoming Science Speak lectures will include uh, next Thursday, we have a presentation on Shrimply Blue, Restoring Lake Tahoe's Clarity One Dog at a Time, um, about mice and shrimp and the dog treats project. And then on March 18th, Professor Hannah Tierney will be speaking on the topic of climate change conspiracies. For all of our upcoming lectures, you can find us at uh, UC Davis or tahoe.ucdavis.edu and forward slash events. So it is now my pleasure to welcome and inter introduce our speakers. Dana Adams is the school psychologist with the Tahoe Truckee Unified School District. And Peter Mayfield is the executive director of Gateway Mountain Center. So I'm going to turn it over to Peter. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Heather, and, and welcome, everybody. I want to start by just helping us all arrive and get grounded. So I'm going to lead a very short little mindfulness exercise. So I really invite you just to get comfortable, feet flat on the ground. And um, this meditation is called the oxygen mask meditation. And it's around that theme of when the cabin pressure is low on the airplane, put on your own mask first. I invite you to close your eyes. Let your attention rest in the feeling of breathing. Give yourself permission to let one simple breath feel good. Invite your breath to slow down, taking a long, slow, smooth inhalation and a long, slow, smooth exhalation. Allow that one simple breath to feel really good, even though no matter what else is going on, this one breath can bring balance and goodness. Now I ask you to place your hand on your heart, breathe into and out of your heart center. Feel the warmth and contact of your hand on your chest. Let your heart soften, let your breath soften. Recalling this past year, offer yourself some kindness. Try saying one or more of these phrases to yourself after I say them out loud. May I be kind to myself. May I accept myself as I am in this moment. May I forgive myself. May I learn something new from my experiences. May I see that I did the best I could under the circumstances. May I have empathy for myself right now. In a moment, We'll open our eyes and return to the room. Take a couple of more breaths and thinking about all that we have faced in this past year, recall something you feel really good about yourself, about in how you've supported kids in your life. 
you're maybe your parent, a grandparent, an uncle, a teacher, something you just a simple memory of something you feel good about yourself. And I invite you to write that in the chat box. So we can just, we lock it in when we type. So in just a moment, give you a little chime bell. When, you, when the sound is done, open your eyes. Okay, thank you. I invite you to uh, type in the chat box for just I'll give 20 seconds for that. Go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead and start. I'm Peter Mayfield. I'm the founder of Gateway Mountain Center. We're a 14 year old nonprofit um, operating with headquarters in Truckee, but we, we work with youth, our local youth from Tahoma to Kingvale and uh, lots of kids in Kings Beach, lots of kids in Truckee. We also work with youth all over Northern California who come to us to visit. Um, okay, so I'm just making sure that I can, here we go. All right, um, just a little more about us. We, we really run in three different areas. We do field trips for schools. These are the visiting schools and that also includes some really great summer camps. We have wellness programs that we run in the alternative education schools. So Sierra Continuation High with classes and field trips, Truckee Community School, um, special field trips and programs for the um, kind of special ed classes for emotional disturbance around the district. And um, we and we work with Dane Adams in, in all of those areas. But we also do individual therapeutic work. And we, we developed a program eight years ago called Whole Hearts, Minds and Bodies, Nature-Based Therapeutic Mentoring. My short talk today is... Um, around lessons learned in this work. So in, in our local area, we work with some of the highest need kids, kids who've really suffered serious complex trauma, um, who have a, a high number of adverse childhood experiences. And um, some of, there's a wide spectrum of the backgrounds of these kids. Some had, um, you know, were in foster care, some had, you know, serious, serious early childhood traumas. Um, some, not so much, but they maybe a, they had a learning difference. They were getting bullied. They got addicted to video games. They got a little older. They got too involved with substances. And they also were really suffering. So kind of a wide range. But all of this has led us to really reflecting on what builds resilience, what provides healing. And, and my goal today is to just is to share lessons learned that we think are applicable to any family any classroom, any, any adult helping a youth. I'm gonna, gonna give kind of the, the big picture overview of some of the theory and practice. And I know Dana's gonna really drill down into some great actionable um, techniques. So our treatment method, we call four roots for growing a human. And, and we apply this method even in our summer camp. So this is like our, our theory of change. Those four roots are authentic relationship, connecting to nature, embodied peak experience, and helping others, connecting the community through service. And I, I can do workshops about all these things. That's not what's happening today. It's just an interesting framework. And I'll, I'll come back to this framework. I'm gonna offer a couple of frameworks here. All of this, all of these four roots help build self-awareness, self-efficacy, um, and self-confidence. This quote, um, this psychologist is amazing, Emmy Werner, um, and I'll read the quote. If we want to help vulnerable youngsters become more resilient, we need to decrease their exposure to potent risk factors and increase their competencies and self-esteem, as well as the sources of support they can draw on. 
Emmy Werner did a really famous study starting in the mid fifties. She, she's, she passed away a few years ago, but she, um, every child born on the island of Kauai in, in 55 and 56, they still track to this day. They check in with each of these, this cohort a couple of times a year. And they derived a lot of amazing research on resilience from this study, the Kauai study, um, looking at kids who struggled and, and succeeded, struggled and didn't succeed. They just had such a big data set and such a long data set. It's really um, an amazing piece of work. And we're in this lineage because we, we work closely with a psychologist named Kathleen Tebb, who was her grad student and, and uh, mentored by by Dr. Werner. I'm gonna share, there's a, a big body of work that just came out right before, right in the middle of Christmas um, called the Roadmap for Resilience. And this came from California's Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. She is the big proponent and, and champion of the whole movement to understand adverse childhood experiences and, and the impacts they have. And they came up with this stress busters wheel Heather has put a link for you um, to this report. It's, it's huge, it's 490 pages, but she, we recommend 35 pages in there, which starts, this is page one of that 35 page. And you can really read each of the spokes on this wheel. They go into some of the medical science, some of the current research. It's, it's a very, very um, readable and accessible and robust report. But um, just looking at this wheel, Supportive relationships is like top upper right corner. That is core and number one. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit more. Of course, quality sleep, good diet, physical activity, mindfulness practice, access to nature. Um, I, some colleagues and I are actually involved a little bit with the ACEs Aware, deeply with the ACEs Aware project. And we think that some of our lobbying helped get that added. Um, mental health care, access to that. All of these are the stress busters um, that help support kids who have suffered from adverse childhood experiences. In a sense, this pandemic is like a unique maybe ACE score on all of us. So relationships, Dr. Bruce Perry is an amazing, huge inspiration for many of us. The more healthy relationships a child has, the more likely he or she will be to recover from trauma and thrive. Relationships are the agents of change and the most powerful therapy is human love. Dr. Perry was the author of um, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, really one of the top books you could ever read about um, child development and, and the healing of stress in childhood and trauma in childhood. He, he has this great, when he gives a presentation, he tells a story that's kind of amazing. He runs the Child Trauma Academy in Houston and they, they deeply study all the kids who come through there. And they looked at sorting out the kids who really did well in the treatment. And the, the kids who did the best in the treatment lived the furthest away from the clinic. And this gave them the realization that it wasn't you know the top child psychiatrists in the world working there. It wasn't all the cutting edge therapy, it was, it was the child having quality time with Uncle Joe who gave him a ride to the hospital. <laughs> so if they lived two hours away, he had that much more quality time. Or, or maybe finally, you know, the, the, the kid had this, you know, really the undivided attention of her mom in that time. And they went out to lunch afterwards. It was actually the quality of relationship that happened because a child needed a long ride into the clinic that made the huge difference. So authentic relationship, um, I'll talk a little bit about with adolescents, with, with teenagers. Um, back to that, the work of Dr. Werner, the Kauai study, she came up with one perfect line that summed it all up, that the kids who, who really struggled and made it through, so maybe they, they got incarcerated at one point, but then they, they went on to lead great lives. The number one factor they found throughout their study was that those kids who succeeded had a consistent caring relationship with a non-parental adult. And in a sense, what we do in our work is, is a professional level of that. We, we think that three and a half hours is more effective than 50 minutes on a couch. We think that shoulder to shoulder, um, exploring 
the outdoors is, is a little better for a lot of adolescents than, you know, looking them in the eye across the room in a therapy setting. So a consistent caring relationship. And a lot of times when, especially when teens are really struggling in a, in a family setting, um, what really helps is to think about how we lived 2000 years ago. It's very little evidence that our, our brains have evolved much in the last 2000 years. Um, 2000 years ago, we lived in these deeply interdependent relationships with, with a small community of like 45 to 60 people in a tribe. And our, our young people, our adolescents evolve their neurologic wiring to be really good in that setting, to connect with other adults. They learned the boys would learn to hunt from the guy two teepees over. The girls would learn to weave baskets from, you know, their, their aunt twice removed, you know, whoever was, they, it wasn't such an emphasis on the nuclear family. And I think in today's modern society, we're not very good at this and adolescents really crave that. And so I, I often counsel parents to just help open doors and make help nurture connectivity for their kids to, to other adults. This is one reason that um, in rural areas, there is uh, double the preponderance of anxiety, depression, suicidality, and hard drug use in, in our United States than there is in urban areas. And a lot of people don't understand that. If, if you live in a, in a really hard household in West Oakland, and I, I work with a lot of kids in that situation, you walk out the door, you will run into a cool adult on your block or you're statistically more likely to do that. Up here in our rural area, that's not quite as easy for a lot of our kids. And so just connecting to other caring adults can be really helpful, especially as the kids get older. Um, yeah, so authentic relationship, key. The next part, my last part, um, risky play. And just, this is all around the theme of self-efficacy, back to what Dr. Werner said, you know, becoming competent. Resilience is built through self-efficacy. The more risks you allow children to take, the better they learn to take care of themselves. And this is a huge thing in our society today. Um, we're, we're so, we become so risk adverse that um, kids don't develop that self-efficacy and, and their sense of self in that way does not get as strong as they need it to be. So they have a weaker sense of self because they don't have that self-efficacy. And, and we see this a lot. Um, there, there's a lot of interesting new science about the benefits of risky play. And it's really important that kids get unstructured free time outside. During this pandemic, I, I felt like a huge mistake was made when the playgrounds were closed and down in the urban areas, the parks were closed. Later, we found out that vitamin D exp uh, was an important immune booster against COVID. So luckily, you know, that's all been corrected, but um, this, is, this is really important. And I, I often counsel parents to like, let their kids walk through rough ground, let them take them to Woodward and bounce on the trampolines, um, whatever you can do to, to give them that, their bodies in motion with a little bit of risk and helping them build their, their efficacy. One observation uh, in many years, along with Dana, um, taking intakes and, and referrals from real kids with serious emotional disturbance. I've yet to have a kid who was, a, who was really into skateboarding come through that system. I'm not saying it won't happen, but you know, that kind of intense physical activity really buffers a person from anxiety and depression and gives them that resilience. So whether kids are little or as they get bigger, and it's easier for little kids to play outdoors, teenagers stop doing it. It's, um, it's really important to encourage that. Time and nature, of course, we kind of take it for granted that we all do it up here. It's actually not the case. Dane and I both lead, go on these field trips where it's like the first time a kid is gone hiking at Donner Summit or the first time a kid has gone skiing, they might've been born and raised in Kings Beach and, and they don't get out. So even though there's trees out the window, we can't assume that people are getting out there. There's so much about the health benefits. I refer you back to that report and you can read the science, the, the positive impacts on our hormones and, and all these things if we spend time outside. 
the final piece <clears throat> there, there is a lot of interesting, I'm not going to geek out with you, don't have time, but there's amazing neuroscience. Um, we study under Dr. Ruth Lanius about like the, what brain scans show around weak sense of self and how activating the vestibular and the sensory motor and proprioceptive can strengthen that for another time. The final piece is the meaning making, finding purpose and, and helping others. And I mean, little kids love to help mommy or daddy. It, they're, we're wired to do that. With adolescents, they are seriously seeking that meaning making. And we really, it, it's so helpful for kids to access that place where they can be helpful to others. And I think something with this pandemic, our, our whole culture, our whole society um, can, can maybe improve a focus on that of, of service and the benefits of service. But kids are, adolescents are really wired for this and, and they don't get enough opportunity. And, and in, when you look at everything going on in our world today, you can really see some teenagers are kind of tuning out. They're kind of, they're almost embarrassed for our generation, the politics, the strife, the dysfunction, the, the, the climatic disaster, all that stuff. And, and instead of retreating against the negativity, it's like finding ways to help, you know, and I know a lot of you do this, you know, show up at Truckee River Day, but doing this regularly makes a huge difference for kids. It gives them resilience to help others. So um, some nice quotes about helping others. I like this one. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. I wanna say thank you. And I'm gonna pass it over to um, Dana Adams. I've so enjoyed working with Dana um, for years. And I'm going to, um, this is a picture of Dana on one of our field trips with the community school at Donner Summit. Dana doesn't just walk her talk, she climbs her talk, kayaks her talk, snowshoes and deep snow about her talk. And, um, and it's all, she does this because she wants to connect with these kids and boy, they trust her because of this. So take it away, Dana. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, uh, I didn't know you were gonna put a picture of me rock climbing on the top of Donner Summit on that one, but thank you. Um, yes, my name is Dana Adams and I am one of the school psychologists for Tahoe Truckee Unified School District. I've been a school psychologist for about 25 years now and I serve three sites in the Tahoe Truckee area. And that's Glenshire Elementary, which is an elementary school, serves uh, TK through fifth. Uh, Sierra High Continuation High School and the community school, Truckee Community School run by PCOE, Placer County Office of Education, serving students who are either expelled from Tahoe Truck Unified, have significant attendance issues um, or on probation. So thank you so much for having me here today. According to the uh, Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention um, from 2019, comparing 2019 to 2020, really from April 2020 to um, October, the proportion of mental health related crises uh, visits for children have increased by 24% from ages 5 to 4, eight, students 5 to 11, and 31% for children uh, 12 to 17 years of age. Um, those are mental health crises that really require uh, significant support uh, through our hospital. Um, but what we do know also is that we have seen a significant increase in research has shown this in anxiety or anxious behaviors and depressive symptoms for our general population of students. Uh, Peter mentioned ACEs and I just wanted to describe that a little bit. Um, ACEs is adverse childhood experiences, usually traumatic events that occur before the age of 18 could be a result of a variety of things, but substance abuse, divorce, financial hardship, violence, and, and um, many other things that increase your ACEs score depending on the traumatic events in someone's life. And we know through the pandemic, the, there's several ways in which ACEs may be exacerbated or increased because of such as uh, social isolation or job loss, school closures, and on and on. Um, 
what we have found, and we're really so much has been done on the research on ACEs, that we're getting so much better at supporting students who have experienced traumatic events, um, and the pandemic can be considered such. So now we know what really what we can do to mitigate and buffer these traumatic events. And, I, and later in my presentation, I'll be kind of going over a little bit of that. In addition to all of that, school school and home stressors, there's a variety of uh, variety of stressors that have impacted our students. And here's a just a list of them. Um, but I wanted to highlight a couple. One is um, motivation. And working at the high school level, especially, this is something I work on all the time, not just during during the pandemic, but a very common uh, issue that I work with with many students. But it's again been exacerbated by the pandemic. What we know about adolescents is that they often are uh, want to come to school and are motivated to come because of the social interactions with their peers. It's a highly motivating factor. And then the younger students at the elementary age are often motivated, motivated by social interaction, but also by um, their teacher and that interaction. And what we know about the pandemic, that's really changed. Our school, our environmental structure of how we do school has changed quite a bit through this pandemic. Um, so those are, that's one area that, uh, that we really are trying to address. Um, another area that I want to address is just um, in regards to the home setting and just the different family dynamics. I, you know, we often hear of, oh, we're all in the same boat. We're all experiencing this together. But really, uh, we're, someone had said, yeah, we're all in the same ocean. Um, we're all doing this together, but we're not necessarily on the same boat. I definitely work with students who there is parent support, parents at home, they're helping connecting to the internet, they're helping with organization, uh, time on task. Um, I have other students who uh, parents are working, they're not in the home, they're trying to use their hotspot with five other uh, siblings or cousins. And it's just a very different um, boat that they're in. And so we're trying to support students in all these different boats and pretty, pretty challenging at times. Um, additional uh, challenges that we're facing um, right now, um, there, again, there is a variety. I talked about same boat, but not. But um, masks have been really hard and icons. And I talk about icons because one of the greatest challenges that our teachers are having is that students really often don't want to be on camera. And we primarily middle school and high school, but we definitely see it at the elementary, uh, at the elementary age that when the, we're trying to determine students' needs, um, social emotional needs and, how, and their affect and how they're doing, when we can't see them on screen, we can't see any of that. And that can be extremely challenging. We're really dependent on um, that, that visual, that social interaction and that visual. Same thing goes when they have masks on during hybrid learning and we're now in hybrid, where often students are attending two days a week and then three, the other three days, they're online. So when they're wearing masks, you can't see facial expressions. You can see their eyes uh, really hard. What happens also is our natural, we have limited natural connections. Typically in a typical year, um, students are passing by my office. I see them out, out in the hallway. Uh, they can come in, they pop in, and those natural connections are not happening. Mitigating ACEs. Um, we I talked about this a little bit earlier, and that's um, PACEs or protective and compensatory experiences. And just like Peter mentioned, the most prominent PACE is the unconditional love of a parent or mentor. And PACEs really um, buffer and mitigate those feel those experience those traumatic experiences. This goes with any any student at this time um, that having at least one friend, mindfulness, exercise, hobbies, and a school that provides resources or other um, in when, regards to research, other areas um, that are protective and compensatory experiences. How to support uh, youth resiliency, and I could talk for days about this. So I just try to pick, I try to find like four areas that I really focus on a lot with students that I work at. Connections, as Peter discussed supports to address stressors, a sense of purpose, and joys. Number one, as Peter mentioned, building and maintaining trust and relationships and connections. Peter mentioned um, uh, mentors, and these are a list of other uh, people that could, be, could act as that, that person that 
uh, our students can build relationships with. Ways to connect, again, we have um, a list, a long list, but I wanted to highlight a couple of them. One is, um, especially for our adolescents, is listening to their music. I'm not a rapper, don't love rap very much, um, but man, I, my, I would say my iTunes account has a ton of rap music and hip hop. And it's a way that um, I know that the adolescents that I work with it calms them, it brings them joy, it's the way they connect. And even though sometimes it's hard to listen to, it's one way that I really um, try to connect with students. Another one is, as Peter mentioned, is adventure together. It doesn't have to be a long day of skiing um, or out um, rock climbing for the day or such that, but um, a walk or um, playing basketball outside, uh, watching movies, playing games. Um, those are all areas that I feel like ways to connect. It could be small, it could be five minutes a day, but that we're connecting. Uh, addressing the stressors. I. The number one thing for me is communication. Uh, you know, in the past, I haven't really shared my cell phone number out to too many students because I connect with them all the time at school. But most parents and most students that I'm working with have my cell phone number because that's the one way they want to text. Um, sometimes I'll call and keeping that communication going. And why that's important is because I want, we want to know what's stressing them out. Um, I don't want to find a quick fix for them, but I want to help them communicate their needs. In addition to that is the collaborative problem solving. So not, I'm not the one that necessarily figures out what they need to decrease their stress, but working together to determine that. With that comes in meeting with the, the team, the school team to discuss the plan. School cha has changed so much um, in these last 11 months that we've met a lot with either the teacher, with, if that's the school um, team or an administrator or the school counselor and me as a school psychologist and really developed a plan to really support the student and their stressors um, and decreasing their stressors through school. Um, as Peter discussed also the sense of purpose, and I wanted to touch on this a little bit more, is that um, it's amazing. Uh, when I do Google Meets with students, uh, many are often still in their bed um, with covers up and they just woke up, but I'm, I'm excited that they're meeting with me regularly, so I go with it. Um, but we, we can easily become complacent um, in our daily lives, especially with teenagers who want to um, just kind of chill sometimes in the room and be alone, which alone space is so important also, but that being productive will lead, it, finding a sense of purpose can transform us into being complacent and productive from being complacent to productive, resulting in healthier lives and very rich experiences. So as Peter mentioned, engaging in activities that are valuable and meaningful and joyful, and that can impact someone else. And I think of it too, we do live in, you know, although Peter said like, we're not a city and live in close quarters, but when it's dumping snow and it's six and seven or eight in the morning and there's lots of snow, it's snowing all day, helping a neighbor next door to shovel or to plow, um, helping somebody through the pandemic get groceries and things like that really can provide a sense of purpose. And we know it's hard as a teenager to motivate them to do so, but as much as we can to provide and support that sense of purpose um, can really increase the resiliency in our youth. And then finding the joy, um, those who work with me, um, they know that I talk about joy all the time. And why I think that's so important is because um, we all need it. And um, I wanted to mention the importance of our parents and our caregivers also finding the joy. And sometimes we're, especially during the pandemic, we're so on it, we have to take care of our kids and our grandparents and our parents and our do it all. And um, even if it's five minutes of finding the joy, when I talk to, students, um, what does create joy for you? And they say, well, I haven't been skateboarding for a couple weeks, or I haven't played basketball just because I haven't, just haven't been motivated. But just finding that five minutes a day that um, really finds joy for them is something that I feel I can support and an easy kind of an easy thing for other people that is in their lives to support also. It creates calm, increases positivity, decreases a feeling of hopelessness. Um, and it really, creates a belief that things can be different, but things can be okay. And I can still find pleasure and I can still find joy. 
And last, um, silver linings. I know it's been a really hard 11 months, um, but I think also looking at those silver linings is super important. Um, we are slowing, we have slowed things down a little bit. We're increasing our connections. We're finding different ways to connect with students um, and we're increasing a sense of community. We are increasing our adaptability, our flexible thinking and our resiliency, and we're supporting our youth along the way. So thank you. Okay, so if anyone would like to put a question in the Q&A, we can answer questions. One question that came up was, what is the age range that you define as youth? Um, I'll answer that, Peter. For me, I think youth is birth through um, when, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. Um, you know, really it's the students that I work with. And again, t t transitional K through, through high school um, is how I, how I say youth, how I picture youth. I don't yeah, know the same with us, with us. We, we, we have the term transitional age youth, which goes to 24 now. Um, they, they, there's brain science about that. Your prefrontal cortex doesn't develop fully until about age 25. So that's, that's a good biological marker. So I'm looking for questions in the Q&A. Um, since there's no questions yet, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us um, since you both met your time frame, your time goals. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely really welcome a conversation. So we, we know that there's a lot of concern out there and we, we wanted to leave a, plenty of space for Q&A. Um, How do you encourage kids to get outside when they are not motivated to get outside? Peter, do you want to do that? I'll, yeah, but we both can. One, um, one thing I think about is it juxtaposition that with screen time, you know, and, and kid, it's really important for all parents to edu be educated on how, it, how intentionally addictive this stuff was designed to be and, and is. And so having some kind of boundary, like you, you can watch your show, but after a half hour of exercise or, and, and do it with them, model it with them. It's, um, we know that can be frustrating, but um, trying to have some kind of limits and boundaries because just to, to not be outside has some real detrimental effects. Um, yeah, so it's, I guess, what do you think, Dana? Do you have some yeah. other? Um, I was just gonna say, oftentimes I'll talk with parents um, of adolescents and they'll say, gosh, he loved skiing when he was eight <laughs> or 10 and he just stopped or he used to skateboard and he stopped. And so I often talk to, um, when I talk with students and I encourage us as parents is to say, hey, you still love this. What is it about that made you stop? And having that conversation, um, what, would it, what would get you excited about it, something that again? And again, that collaborative conversation, I feel is super important at really getting to like, why, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? Um, and it could be something that's not in your, um, like they don't maybe don't want to go cross country skiing or even downhill skiing. They might want to go, outside and play basketball with a friend or um, something different than, than what you've thought of. And so that collaborative conversation, I feel like it is very important. And like Peter said, sometimes it takes a little bit of uh, reinforcement uh, afterwards to get them in ex first externally motivated and then internally motivated. Oh, this did feel good. This getting outside did feel fine, but saying like, hey, let's go um, go for a walk and then, hey, we'll go to pick up some sushi afterwards. Um, so again, that external motivation can kind of get that internal motivation going. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one little thing too, which is, you know, it's easy to look at like climbing or, or skiing or these big nature experiences, but, you know, grabbing a pen and paper and, and drawing an insect on the leaf in the backyard, like it, it can be little nature they can be very rich, you know, so just prompting or sharing that experience, like, let's go figure out what bird that is that we hear every morning, you know, just little explorations can be really want, Sorry, Peter. I just yeah, want to validate though, I get it. Um, 
I work with those stu the student you're talking about often, and it just takes a lot of conversation. I do um, during the pandemic. I um, with physical distancing, I have gone on quite a few walks with students, um, and they didn't want to go for many many <laughs> calls. And then I'll say, hey, we're just going to walk down just about 10 minutes, not a big deal. And now it's gone up to, you know, 45 minutes. And because they have seen that, oh, that feels good, that does help. Um, but I, I want to validate that. Um, I definitely hear what you're saying that it can be very challenging. So kind of combining a couple questions. Um, what if the kids don't want to get out of their PJs, or they say their only source of joy is video games? or they don't want oversight, or they already know everything, so they're, so they're uh, difficult to try to uh, get them to participate in these activities. I'll, I'll thing, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go. No, you go, Dana. Okay, all I was gonna say is, um, God, those video games. I, um, I talk about video games a lot with students and, I've, and I don't play them uh, but I talk about it a lot. It's a huge motivating um, piece for students and they just want to be in their PJs in bed and I get it. Um, just on a kind of a side note, it's one way to connect for sure is actually hanging out in your PJs with them and playing video games, but then saying, hey, we're going to do this for 40 minutes, but then we're going to head outside together or we're going to go head outside and let's play video games. Um, again, uh, I get it that, it that it can be really challenging, but it's kind of like that, again, collaborative problem solving, that reinforcement piece and then connecting and doing it with them, what they love to do for a little bit, kind of that compromise. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I guess I, I would also say that um, we were seeing a lot of this, especially last spring when at the, the first six weeks of shelter in place, it, it is also natural for kids to really kind of um, respond by or react by kind of shutting down a little bit and lower energy. And, and so some acceptance of that, but then like, okay, we did that this morning and now we're getting outside. Um, but just, yeah, you know, it's, it was natural. A lot of parents were calling us really concerned, like, wow, my, my child is just like 10% of the energy they used to have. And, and just appreciating that, that that's a natural human response to stress too. Um, but then hold their hand and get outside and get moving. It's really important. I just also wanted to address, Peter, um, but kind of what you said is that net need for alone time. Um, what we know through the pandemic is our family dynamics changed and there has been very limited alone time for many. And so we all need it as adults and as adolescents and children. And so allowing that alone time um, to an extent Yep. Um, I, I tend to get concerned and I work with um, parents tend to get concerned a little bit, you know, definitely more when there's days on end when they're not seeing their, their, their child or their adolescent. Um, um, but we do know that it's very normal adolescent behavior, typical adolescent behavior to want some alone time in their room for extended periods. So there's a couple questions uh, looking for ideas for how our community could create more opportunities for the youth to volunteer or a way for adults to volunteer to do mentoring or questions about, um, you know, as, as uh, like the Children's Museum, Kids Own Children's Museum begins to reopen, like what kinds of things, are there any programs that you know of or ideas for um, creating these experiences for kids right now, considering the safety issues? Hmm. I can respond. Um... It's interesting during the, this time because there's limited uh, ability to have that uh, physical closeness. Um, I do feel, you know, we know that at the high school level, it's at TTUSD at least, um, we have the, uh, it's a requirement to have, to do community service as part of the graduation requirement. That has, um, because of the pandemic, we've had to, um, change that up a little bit for sure this in the this past year and probably this year. Um, but there there is that opportunity. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, a lot of our students um, volunteer at, at the Humane Society. Um, they will do something at the, at the uh, senior center. Um, you know, the senior center in Truckee often needs some uh, support. Um, I also feel like it doesn't have to necessarily be um, something 
that's organized, but uh, looking to um, our, the elderly in our community or um, somebody that might need support. Um, and so I know right now it's really challenging to find those, those options, so. Peter. Yeah, I, I'd say the same thing. I mean, in, in years past, we had kids help um, up in Van Norden Meadow at Donner Summit with, you know, collecting data or, or this summer there'll be a huge restoration project. So we're excited to um, enlist some local teens to plant, you know, revegetate and do things like that. But I, I agree with Dana. Some right now it's like, like looking for the person on your block that needs that extra help it might be the easiest. And then as things open up, um, hopefully there are all sorts of service opportunities. You know, our organization definitely <clears throat> tries to um, make some of those happen. And, um, but it is really limited right now. So yeah, I was even going to offer, um, we have a citizen science Tahoe program where uh, people can go out that you just download the app and you can collect data about the water quality, about the algae that's growing on the rocks, about whether you see litter and pick it up. So even those kinds of cleanups, then um, the League to Save Lake Tahoe has a uh, blue crew program for trash cleanup, trash and litter. And uh, as spring is approaching, there'll probably be more and more of that. Um, there was a comment about dialectical behavioral, behavioral therapy um, as a tool to help teens. It seemed to mimic what you shared in the stress buster circle. Are there any, have you heard of any dialectical behavioral therapy groups or could we consider starting one? I know there's um, a DBT uh, group in, in Reno um, that a few of my students have participated in. So I know that that's uh, available in the Reno area. I don't know of um, in the Truckee area at this time, but I can get back to whoever that person is. Um, or you can always email me at dadams at ttusd.org and I can try to get you more information on that. And then any tips for um, kids and parents of kids who are not attending classes, won't talk to support staff, won't talk to counseling, um, you know, anxiety levels are higher, um, how, to, how to respect limitations and deal with that. Okay, I'll, well, I'll start because you, you have a lot of, I'll, yeah. I'll get a little overview and then hand it to you, Dana, because you're yeah. in school. For sure. One, one thing I, I think that's really important um, is that is to sort of for parents to like try hard to lower their anxiety, their own anxiety about this. Um, it is not ultimately kids can catch up ultimately, you know, like like getting a couple of bad grades in a couple of quarters in these times does not determine their future. And I just see this high stress like that people think that, you know, this semester, it, there's a lot of pressure on it. And the beauty of American education is it's not really that way. You can, you can go as far as you want to go once you're passionate to go there. So um, just ooh, try to relax. And then, um, oh, I'll, I'll hand it to Dana about some specifics, but, you know, for some of the kids we're supporting in the same situation, it's like trying to make like little pieces, little goals, like, let, okay, you're not going to pass five classes, let's pass two. Um, and then, you know, make it up next semester, that kind of thing. We're working with some, you know, kids who are on the edge of that. But um, yeah, to Dana. <laughs> uh, I would say um, the level of anxiety for some students is so high. Um, Peter talked about the prefrontal cortex of your brain that when your amygdala's go, you know, you're so stressed that you're not really problem solving right now, right? You're, um, it's really, really hard to think like, okay, I can do this and I'll feel less stressed. Um, so as, as much as you can to, um, my, my recommendation is reading, really trying to meet with your school team um, because maybe having that collaborative problem solving discussion with your, your child or your student. Um, first, like what is, what do you think it is about um, what's going on for you that you don't want to attend um, the distance learning? Um, oftentimes we'll hear, right? It's, um, I don't wanna be on screen. Um, I can't keep up. It's too hard to organize um, myself. I can't do it. Um, when we kind of can get an idea of what's going on, meeting with your school team, even if it's just one teacher and saying like, hey, let's focus on ELA right now, English language arts. Um, 
And let's really focus on um, that's your area of strength. You really love to write or you really love to read. Um, so let's meet with your ELA teacher. We're going to do it. Um, and, and let's talk about it and really maybe like Peter said, focus on one at a time. So um, I really, I, at TTOSD, our school teams are awesome. And I really feel like teachers uh, really want students to be successful and they really want to serve those students um, and address those stressors. So as much as you can just say, we're meeting on Tuesday at three <laughs> and we've already scheduled it and we need to happen. Once that happens, I often believe that once we come up with a plan, um, a student actually feels so much less anxiety, like, okay, the teacher knows I'm having trouble with this. We worked out a plan that I only, I can keep my camera on, but I only have to show the top of my forehead and the teacher knows I'm there. Like we, I feel like teachers and administration, school staff are really trying to accommodate and support students because we know it's challenging. I'll add one more thing on that piece around when, when, when there's conflict, when there's strife around these issues, uh, back to Dr. Bruce Perry, a really good thing to remember are the three R's and it goes in this order, regulate, relate, reason. So, you know, if, when you, and, and I'm, I'm in the middle of some of these with some of our high need families, you know, when, when there's a, a conflict about work and, and anger happens and dysregulation happens, you know, that's not the time to start, you know, hammering the kid with logic. Like you need to do this or you'll fail. You know, you, you have to calm down, you have to relate. Then after those two things, you can reason. So it's just always a good thing to remember as a strategy. You're, you're not gonna be able to discipline them into compliance with schoolwork when they're upset, mm -hmm. so. There was a question about um, how do you, what do you feel about the use and effectiveness of antidepressants for teenagers? Do they work? Are they recommended? Um, big question. Good question. It's really individualized. Um, yeah, I I've seen antidepressants. I've I've, I've seen them um, support students in. Um, through what they're going through, but it's really would be a super general statement to say they work or they don't work. It's really an individualized decision working with um, a psychiatrist um, or a medical doctor in determining that need for that particular student. Yeah, I agree. It's um, the, the science of like that actually, you know, an antidepressant is solving a neurochemical imbalance is there's, you could read a lot about it and it's, um, um, it's not solid, but uh, like Dana, I've seen it work really well. And some of that is the context. Like if a kid is suffering and they get their mom to take time off work and they drive to see a psychiatrist and they sit there and they're offered, um, you know, a small dose of something that they're told should help them. It often does. And it, it probably would, if it was a sugar pill too, in many cases, and some of the studies show that, but, you know, but that can be helpful because a kid is like, I need help they're seeing a doctor, they're offered some help. So um, it's a big topic. And but yeah, we're not, we, we were in our organization, therapeutically, we're part of a movement to see the more skilled, the future, more skillful use of medication, which would be a reduction of it and shorter term, um, and that type of thing. I, I like to tell people think of it as a cast. When you break your wrist, the healing happens within the cast just gives a little support. And, and ultimately the healing has to happen within. So sometimes medication is like a cast um, so, the, so that the kid's a little more regulated and the healing can happen within. The mistake is to think the pill will do it all. That's not the, the, the case. And I would say, um, directing at that particular uh, question, if you are concerned that your child or adolescent is um, depressed or clinic depressed, I very much encourage you to seek medical, medical support, whether it start from your family physician um, or a psychiatrist to really address that. Um, and like Peter said, it is that umbrella of different parts that are going to support your student, your child um, through that. But um, definitely we want to make sure that your, um, you and your child are getting that support that you might need. So what are the signs of a child's mental distress if they say everything's okay, but you're worried that maybe it's not, or so what, what, what are some of the signs of that mental distress in youth? Peter, do you want to start or you want me to start? 
I'll let you go with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, it's really individual. I, I would probably ask that person, um, what makes you feel that way? Um, what's going on for the student that you feel they're in distress? Um, so I would kind of, I would want more information on that. Um, we know that adolescents often say, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm good, all is fine. Um, and so again, it's that connection with that trusted adult um, and spending time with that, with your, with your child or adolescent to really get to know what, what's really going on. I would see, I would also say that um, living with, living in close proximity, we, we tend to see day by day a little bit more, right? Um, because uh, you can see if are there patterns or behavior. Is your is your child wanting to sleep all day and not attend school? Do you see changes? Are they lack of appetite or are they not sleeping? And you know, um, there's definitely things that we're looking for. I guess that would those would be signs when rapid change in behavior um, that you haven't typically seen um, for a little bit longer periods of time. So. Yeah, I just add one thing, which is, you know, classic, um, no longer enjoying things that used to be enjoyable, you know, just like, um, again, it's, it's complex right now. I mean, during, you know, during shelter in place, that was such a big thing. It was scary. It was stressful. And um, we all had some of that. Um, but I think really tune into your own sensation. You, you as a parent, you, you have a strong gut feeling and and definitely seek help. Um, it is it is out there, and it's it it's important for kids to get contact if if you feel like they're really becoming depressed. Uh, I think there was one question that I missed earlier on was was there support for the parents that are having a hard time? <laughs> yeah, that's why I mentioned self care at the beginning. Um, you know, can't can't take care of the troops unless you take care of yourself. And so um, definitely feel that as parents, uh, we need to, again, take self to have self some self care ourselves and get out ourselves and have alone time ourselves, right. So all those things are important as much as possible, as much as we can do, and then get the support you need. Um, working for Tahoe Truck Unified, I just want to say again that we are here to support you. And there are a lot of students and a lot of students need support. And I feel like we're trying really hard to support parents through this. Um, and at the same time, we know that it, it is really, it is really hard time and can be really challenging right now, but self-care is number one, um, as much as you can. Okay. And I'm going to end on this fun question. This is a great one to end with is how can all of us in the community help support your efforts to support the youth in our community? I'll, I'll, I'll go first and then Peter, you can end it. Um, for me is, um, I love partnering with parents. I, I would say what we need as um, school staff um, is really partnering with parents in supporting youth. And um, we want to know, um, and we want to we want communication. And we want to know what's going on for our students. And again, like I said in my presentation, it's really hard not, it's really hard right now to know what our students are needing regularly because we don't see them as much as we want. So that parent connection that parent communication, um, that's what I would want, so. And I guess I'll just make a plug for all of the nonprofits in the system of care, you know, ourselves included, but, um, you know, we need community support. Um, I know the Community Foundation is launching another fundraising effort for frontline nonprofits and the demands have skyrocketed. All the nonprofits are feeding more people, giving more rent support. We, we got 35 new referrals in the last seven weeks, same as all last year. Um, so yeah, and, and talk to your new neighbors who just bought homes up here and encourage them to get involved with new with the nonprofits. The, the safety net of our community depends on community support. So thank you for yes, that great you. question. Excellent. Um, so I will just pop that one link in uh, regarding the ACES Aware um, site that you gave the pages that you recommended and those were uh, pages 94 to 128 and that's the full roadmap and that's in the in the chat if anyone wants to click on it now before we end but um, pretty perfect timing that we end and then email addresses um, they're wondering if they can grab your email addresses again so I almost think I can do it it's dadams mm -hmm. at ttusd dot org Peter at sierraexperience.org. 
All right, so hopefully I spelled those correctly. Those were the two. And again, this will be record. This has been recorded and will be available eventually on the uh, UC Davis Tahoe Environmental Research Center website. Um, I put the link in the chat as well. And thank you all for, in, for uh, joining us and hopefully this was useful. And thank you very much, Dana and Peter, great job. Um, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. It's important work and um, you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Thank you, Heather. Thank right. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. I'll give everybody one more second here to uh, grab those links if anyone needs them and stop the recording.